Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for being here. You really hung in there, and we're happy to have so many people present for this session. My name is Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I'm moderating today's panel. Um, I'm here, I, I'm employed currently at CSU Channel Islands. Um, I have a long history of working for and with the CCC system um, in many different ways, and I'm a regular at OTC, so I'm really happy to be here and be part of this year's learning community with all of you. Um, I have shared previously, I'm gonna repeat this for the archive and those of you who are just coming in, we do have a resource site for this session that has the slides, links to research that will back up what you hear today, um, as well as some other goodies, including a, a link to a back channel if you'd like to have some conversation with your peers um, on something other than Twitter, which you're also welcome to use. We encourage that, so learn the way you learn best. And with that said, let me introduce a little bit of what we're doing here today. Um, can you pull up the, the PowerPoint slide now, just yep. so we're there? Oh, great. So this is a panel about humanizing online learning for social justice and equity. Um, I wanna start by thinking about the phrase, regular and effective contact which we hear all the time, and it's part of ed code, and we know that ed code doesn't really appeal to the, the emotional side of human beings very much, but so we know that that's important. It gets reiterated over and over again. Humanizing really takes that concept and puts it in a framework that means something. And it helps us to think about why it's important for us to be present in our class. And it really puts an emphasis on online instructors and if you teach online, it makes you realize how critical you are to learning, okay? So humanizing online learning, it's good teaching. And it, it supports the needs and the interests of all students. With that said, if we drill into things a little bit further, we see that humanizing can support the needs of our underserved student populations significantly. And if we start to unpack the idea of success and look at it through different lenses, look at it through a lens of equity, um, which we're gonna do here in just a little bit, we start to find some compelling and rather disturbing things about what happens online when underserved populations learn online. So um, what we're gonna do today is dig into that. And we've got a wonderful panel of four presenters who are gonna present mini sessions to you, mini presentations. And they all are bringing something very unique and diverse to the table, looking at this through different lenses. We're gonna get started with Ray Kopp, um, and Ray is gonna present some research to you, his own research that I think you will find fascinating. It's played a very formative role in my own approach to online teaching and learning and faculty development. And then we're gonna turn it over to Fabiola Torres, um, Josh Ramirez, and Kim Vos who are going to speak through the lens of, of, of an online, a faculty member, and talk about some of their strategies that they're using in their online classes. So we all hope that you will leave today's session with at least one idea or something that just resonates with you and you think about for a while and take something practical back um, and meaningful. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Ray. Thank you so much. Uh, start the timer. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Ray Kalp. Uh, I am uh, the Director of Workforce Development at College of San Mateo. It's my day job. And then uh, weekends, uh, uh, every once in a while, uh, I teach at uh, San Francisco State in the, do in the Educational Leadership Doctoral Program there. I teach uh, quantitative research methods, and I teach uh, class in leadership there. Uh, so. Uh, that's who I am, and this uh, talk is about the online penalty, is what I refer to it as. Uh, there is this, uh, my, I did a ton of research about, you know, online, you know, is it better? I read every study, I read all the meta, meta studies. Uh, uh, this is my favorite quote from all of it. Online classes are as good or as bad as face-to-face -face classes. This idea that it's better or worse is, uh, that's, it's, the aggregation kills you. Uh, so, uh, just to illustrate that, the data set that I looked at was, uh, and try and, okay, stick with me for a second here. This is a little bit 
dense, but the, 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 what's in this data set is, yeah, I'm gonna have to read you some of what's on there, but the, I guess the slides are on the site too. Uh, only white and Latino students. So from the Chancellor's Office MIS system, I pulled grades of white and Latino students plus all of their student identifiers, so bog, bog, age, gender, everything that's in there, and their grade in a class. And in order to be in there, the class had to be a class that they, that student took on the campus where they took it, it was offered in both a face-to-face -face and online format. Otherwise, they're not in the data set. So the idea was, I was only choosing white and Latino students who had a choice between an online or a face-to-face -face version of the class that they needed for whatever it was they were doing, right? Uh, so I was trying to get away from, yeah, I had to take the online class uh, kind of deal. Uh, and this list here shows by the left column is the student's goal, why, they, why they're at the community college. Those are the ones they check off. I'm there to uh, improve my job skills, basic skills, transfer, et cetera. And the first column is their, the average grade of all of the students who took, who, who had that purpose um, in a face-to-face, -face, and it took a face-to-face -face class and all of those who took an online class. So the best we do in online, it, you're better off taking an online class if your purpose is to acquire job skills or if you're a four-year student who's picking up a class that you need. Those are the ones where it's, they actually do better in the aggregate in online classes than in face-to-face -face classes. The worst one, high school diploma or GED, transfer, transfer, undecided. But none of them are all that far off if you look at it. Uh, this this uh, effect size is, is, is expressed in standard deviations. So you can do the math on the grade point. This is 0.08 of a grade point, right? Uh, that represents 0.05 of standard deviations. The stars are for statistical significance. So there they are. They range from you can do better to you can do worse, just inside of our own data set. So that quote kind of hangs together. It gets interesting, though, when you disaggregate it. So this is disaggregated by the purpose. Let's take this one example here, uh, which update job skills. It is statistically significant, but not a meaningful difference. It's essentially the same outcome either way. Now let's disaggregate it by gender and ethnicity. And remember, the only people in here are white and Latino, or Hispanic is what the MIS system calls it. The face-to-face -face enrollments in this data set are a a little more than one-third Latino, a little less than two-thirds white, okay? That, the pie looks like that. In the online enrollments, it's more white students, right? It's a little less than a quarter Latino and a little more than three-quarters white students. So stop for a minute and do the math without looking at the data. If you have a larger proportion, if you have an achievement gap, I'm not that fond of that word, but if you have an achievement gap between white and Latino students, just generally, and you have more white students in this group and more Latino students in this group, the, the preponderance of the white students will have a tendency to bring the average grade up in that group, and they'll have a tendency to bring the average grade down in this other group, right? So we have more, a larger proportion of white students in online classes, which has a tendency to raise the grades in online classes in the aggregate. And it masks the, what's actually going on. If you, de, if you, if you, if you uh, disaggregate the data, you'll see, yeah, remember this is, uh, folks who are there to go update their job skills. That was the category. There's about 67,000 records here, uh, in just in this bucket. There's four, about 4.4 million students who are white or Latino over the three-year period who took a class that qualified for this. So, uh, of these 67,000, no, no effect really for male, I'm not quite on the Latinx piece yet, uh, so for Latino, uh, no real difference there, 
but for women, this is not a great this is not a great outcome. And you can argue about whether you know 0.14 standard deviations matter, but I got to tell you, point two tenths of a grade point matters if you're at 1.9 versus 2.1, or if you're trying to get into Cal, two tenths of a grade point matters a lot. The overall effect on this one is that it, it exacerbated the achievement gap by 41%. And this data doesn't show up in the reports that get published about online because we don't disaggregate it by ethnicity and gender. We report the aggregate, and the aggregate overstates the success rate in online and understates the success rate um, in in face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, so th in the aggregate, every ethnic, every combination, I got a question, yeah. No. No, the, the point was in, in this particular, in this particular example, uh, yeah, so the question is, is the point that uh, Latinas are, are doing worse in online classes? No. In this particular disaggregation, which is by the goal of updating job skills, yes, that's true, but it doesn't play in every category. You kind of have to disaggregate it across all the categories to see what's going on in each one of those categories. Generally speaking, Latinas have the biggest penalty for being in online classes, followed by Latinos, followed by white women, follow, and then white men do the best. But it depends on, but there are sl some slight variations in that depending on what, which, of the, which of the goals are in there. Um, I guess the, the, the real point here is that overall the achievement gap, this is all four and a half million records. So the, overall the achievement gap is exacerbated by 44%. Uh, by, by, the, by the way that we have implemented online classes. The response from the institution, I interviewed um, administrators, support people, some faculty people, asked them why this was happening, showed them these results, everybody was stunned. Asked them what was going on, ah, well, here's what I got. Y you know, online, you gotta have a lot more discipline. You gotta have a lot more discipline on the online thing because there's nobody there looking over, over you. So you have to have those, uh, this willingness. You gotta show up. So it's about motivation. Or it's about technology. Uh, you know, it's, remember this is Latino and white students. So it's about technology. Latino students don't, ha don't have the technology. Or it's about language. Well, I don't speak English as well. Um, these are student deficits, right? This is saying, if, we just, if they would just send us better students, we could do better. You know? uh, the students, if you ask the students about their, uh, those topics in their classes, about motivation, and I interviewed a lot of students and did content analysis across those qualitative interviews, they, they get it. They get the, the online class. They recognize it is going to be harder in some ways and maybe easier in other ways, but overall they get it that it's not going to be an easier deal. This is a myth amongst Latino students. No, they're not stupid. Uh, the, other, the other myth to a certain extent, remember I've selected, for, these are folks who chose to take an online class. So the technology thing doesn't play quite as well here. Uh, you know, that's a little bit of old news. Uh, and the language thing, I actually did content analysis on the responses of the Latino students versus the responses of the faculty and staff. They're, they're the same. They're, they, their language was fine. Uh, they, they were every bit as articulate as, as the faculty and staff responses on those qualitative interviews. So that wasn't it either. It turns out if you ask Latino students what the best class they ever had is and what the worst class they ever had is, the worst class they ever had was the one there was no relationship between them and the, inst and the instructor, or uh, they didn't like answering questions, right? right? The teacher didn't like answering questions. The best class they ever had was when somebody engaged with them and when they asked the question, when, when the teacher asked a question of the student, it wasn't trying to catch them, you know, for sleeping or waking up. It was because they genuinely wanted to know what that student thought about that topic. 
and students can tell the difference between those two approaches. So it turns out, uh, and in the online classes, yeah, this is a bunch of quotes, but the top right corner is my favorite. Uh, you ask them about their online instructor, I never met the guy. I don't know if he's a good teacher or not. This is after they finish the class. I never met the guy. And, and the reality is that we could be using technology to solve these problems, not to exacerbate them. Uh, there's plenty of literature uh, about the soci and I, again, I was focused on the, the issues around Latino students most, but there's plenty of you know, so sociocultural construction of educación in Mexico, Central America is all about a mutually respectful relationship between maestro and, and, the, and the student, be between the student and the, and the instructor, that, that, and it's two-way respect. You have to have both, yeah, this professor has to respect the student and what the student brings in order for education to be effective. And we could do that. Web 2.0 is all about constructing content. I mean, we have all the tools to do it. These folks here are gonna walk you through some examples of tools to do it. Uh, and I was just laying the, f the groundwork here, so I'm gonna pass it over to Fabiola. I think yours is, ah, there you go. Great, thank you very much. So I'm gonna jump right in. Um, I call this method learning nudges, you know, that come on, you can do it, or hey, I'm there. The information that was presented to you about motivation and feeling like you know, you're connected to your teacher is something that I find extremely helpful um, as a learner myself and also in the online community. So I'm gonna jump right in. So I basically say that we're using tools and I'm gonna say easy tools, tools that deal with bandwidth um, that, you know, that we don't have to deal because a lot of inner city areas, like I know where I live, we can, we're lucky if we get five megs per second. So, you know, again, we have to keep these, uh, these tools and the, the strength that it takes to run them in mind. But basically, it's basically, sh it, this is, learning nudges is about being more than just the computer, okay? Um, so I have here, I have some methods here, and I call this the Wizard of Oz. You know, what's behind the curtain? Uh, when students are able to see the face of the instructor who is guiding them through a course, they are more likely to trust that professor, and they feel more invested in the course and then students will see more than just a teacher, they see a human. And as I always say to my faculty, they will hate you less. <laughs> students who feel connected, you know, they're, they're also willing to stay, okay? So who's behind the, the, this curtain, okay? We show us ourselves. Um, I have here, all you need is love. Sometimes we have to remember, we have to love what we do. We have to love our discipline. Think about ourselves from kindergarten all the way through our PhD programs. Think about that teacher who really loved their course content, okay, and presented that course content with love. So it just comes down to basics sometimes. Um, and, uh, you know, who are you? Who, you know, let the you t come out, that love come out. And so what I have is I have a public Instagram that every time before the semester, I always know students are looking at me because my likes suddenly start to come up and they get to see the, the you know, me uh, and, and the work that I do. I teach ethnic studies. So whether it's something that I'm involved politically or if I'm playing with my dogs, it's both. So um, that's why I use the Instagram. Um, tap into the dork side. You don't have to be perfect. Imperfections demonstrate our human side. Uh, and be connected. Tap into, you know, uh, the synchronous instruction or synchronous office hours. And I have here an image, and if you have access to the slides, you know, I have here this really silly one that said, okay, any questions? No, 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 actually, yes. Can you teach all my classes? I feel like I'm, I learn more in the half hour and I'm in Skype lecture than an hour and a half in my other courses. The other, I say, ha, 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 you made my day. The next student, I'm literally in my Java programming class right now. Seriously, best class ever. And so I just want to say that I did tell the student, don't do that. <laughs> Here, I have this picture because I wanted to show that 16 people showed up to my synchronous session. Um, and that was a fun class to navigate. I use, I use a, a Skype chat, okay? Um, if you have the videos, I mean the slides, you'll get access to these video um, links. One of them is a video montage, which I will show right now, and um, a, a video that I showed about myself, and it's actually a video about my mother and how she, 
basically made our family survive, uh, you know, just growing up as an immigrant family um, in Los Angeles and the little techniques that she did. Um, but the thing I wanted to emphasize in this is how this is, this does have a social justice side. Uh, because it's us, we're taking responsibility of our course. We're showing that we really care. And so we try, we use our, our, our tools in front of us to be able to, um, you know, have that nudge. And so I have here a little montage that I created just to kind of show the dork side, the love, and what's behind the curtain kind of at all Hi in class. one time. Welcome to week two. So we are officially in deep into our course content. And this week we're going to be introduced to the godfather of ethnic studies. Okay, that was cheesy. <laughs> Hi class, welcome to week seven. Yes, I'm watching the Packer game, but they're ahead, they're gonna win. We have these, these uh, you know, fables that obviously created a perception and many might argue we still have them today. Hi class, week seven. Oh my God, next week and that's it. Hi class, welcome to week 11. Can you imagine that? So this week and on to next week, we're going to have our unit three group research project. Yes, group research, check your email. Make sure you research the word, you know, go in the internet. I mean, you have the world in the palm of your hand when you're in college, you have to make sure that you keep searching until you find the information that best benefits your understanding. This class is not about technology. This class is about learning about ethnic minorities in the US. Okay, so let's not get stuck with the tool of technology. I'm here to ensure that you develop your skills for the 21st century. Don't freak out, okay? It is my job to prepare you. And so what I'm going to say in this message is going to be extremely important for you to prepare for your first assessment. Come on guys, you can do it. We can do it. Let's get rid of uh, our, our first assessment with all perfect grades, okay? Be on Skype, be on Skype, be on Skype. See ya. So again, it's just it's it, it it has that connection. You could you can tweet the link. You can tweet the links. Uh, d d chat, you know, send the link through Canvas. Um, YouTube, it's so easy to close caption. So if that question comes up, this was the montage for this presentation. Closed captioning, super easy. You're so aware of how you speak because of course the clearer you are, the better at closed captions and less correction. Um, or uh, pictures, you know, where I'm somewhere and like I, I, will sh I will eventually take a picture of us so that my students know that I'm here. I'm missing class to be here. So um, anyway, um, that's all. We'll, I'll continue forward with our next person. So. Good afternoon, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joshua Ramirez. I'm a professor of psychology at Santa Barbara City College. I'm also the psychology department chair. Go figure, three years into the job and the job description itself said eventually department chair. Couple of, the, can we? And I'm still standing. Uh, the interesting thing about being department chair, you get a chance to be able to get to know the deans. I actually got a chance to look into my emails from the first year, and Kenley, you sent me an email that said, um, the psychology department uh, may have a new challenge in store for them. What if we had an associate's degree for transfer entirely online for psychology? And at the time, I could understand why he wanted to ask for that because at the time we only had one class in psychology that was online. It was our Psychology 100 General Psychology course. And so it was one of the challenges that I wanted to try to address for the department. Um, and in trying to bring that back to some of my colleagues, um, they ha were very kind about some of the comments that they offered saying, well, that's something that we can certainly look into when the technology is finally there. Then it turned into a minefield of obstacles where they started to say, Josh, you don't want to lose your connection with your students, do you? I'm just trying to think, why does 
being online mean that I have to lose that connection with my students? And then there were more curt responses that said, yes, and good luck trying to offer a research methods course or a physiological psychology course. Why not just give your students an EEG machine to go with it? Maybe they can scan their brains at home as well. And then you can imagine just what other disciplines might say. How am I supposed to be able to infuse online education with performing arts? How am I going to be able to teach students how to be able to act and how to be able to direct? And all I'm thinking when I'm encountering a lot of these, uh, these little obstacles is, I'm not looking for digital utopia. I'm just trying to look at the digital environment right now and to say, what can we do with the existing technology as it is right now to be able to do better with, uh, by our students? And I look at a headline like this in the Chronicle of Higher Education that says that we need to be able to meet that challenge of being able to give students the kind of experiences that we would hope that they would have in a face-to-face -face class online. And so when the question turned to trying to figure out how to be able to digitally augment my own instruction, I had to start off with the kind of experiences that I wanted my students to have long-term projects, being able to work collaboratively, the undergraduate research experience itself, not an easy thing to always translate online. But when I thought about the research paper and when I thought about all of the components through an entire semester that my students would have to be able to surmount together, then I thought the technology is actually there. The biggest lesson for me, however, wasn't that I had to teach the students to adopt and to adapt the technology. That they were the ones who were going to teach me how to be able to use the technology itself. The students decided that they needed some kind of medium to be able to work collaboratively together. We are a one college district, and so students are sometimes commuting at a distance. They tell me, I can't get together with my students, uh, with, my, with my other classmates together whenever I want, but here they decided to use Google Slides to be able to set up a template with each and every one of these text boxes very simply put together to allow them to annotate articles, organize them into a literature review, and to watch them shift on screen every one of those papers and to see their thought process was an amazing thing. They decided to legacy that template to my future classes. You look at the analysis portion of a research paper. The students decided to use VoiceThread. This student decided to take a picture of one of the components of the analysis and decided to try to share his work and to try to have a, an asynchronous conversation about how to be able to solve the problem. And they gave each other feedback. This group, uh, group of students, after the analysis, after the final write-up, decided to translate their work into an APA-style presentation. But one of the things that they wanted to do was to improvise voice thread for one of their classmates. She had an, a readily diagnosed anxiety disorder. She didn't want to get up live in front of students. And they decided that they would try to work together as a team to be able to asynchronously provide each and every one of their portions of the demonstration itself so that they could present an APA style poster presentation. Again, the big lesson for me, it was as much about learning to adopt and to adapt the technology as it was to be able to give the students enough scaffolding and enough freedom and enough trust to be able to use the technology so that we could mutually, collectively create the kind of learning experiences that we would hope to be able to have in face-to-face -face instruction. And on top of that, they taught me that the very same technology could be used for face-to-face -face instruction itself. I now use a lot of these methods that I would typically use online for in-person classes. For the large lecture environment where students need to be able to work together and to create cohorts, that kind of approach using these technologies has been a real boon. Our own institutional research seems to suggest that part-time status students are on the rise. They are increasingly looking towards the online environment to be able to supplement their education and to allow them the flexibility to be able to meet normative time to degree. And so the evolving challenge for us is to be able to try to translate many of the practices that we use online into the face-to-face -face environment and vice versa. It's an ongoing challenge that I've accepted. I know a lot of you have long been accepting that challenge. It's one of the reasons why I'm glad to be here. Many of you are my models, um, and so therefore I am very grateful to all of you. I learn a lot from you, and I hope to continue to do so. So thank you.
Okay. <clears throat> How does this thing work? All right, got it. Okay, um, thanks everyone for hanging in with us for all this time. I'm Kim Vose. I teach in the English program at Cal State Channel Islands. So what I wanted to talk to you today about was is supporting, create, cultivating a su supportive community with voice in online classrooms. So in my experience, um, one of the biggest challenges that students face is overcoming imposter syndrome. That sneaking feeling in the pit of your stomach that says, you don't belong here, you're not smart enough, you can't do this. Um, and one of the ways that I've done that um, is I tell all of my students, whether they're face-to-face -face class, first-year students, transfer students, whoever they are, I tell them all the story of my own educational path. Um, I'm a first-generation student. I didn't go to college until I was 24. I started at a community college and then transferred. And you know, one of the biggest challenges for me was that sneaking feeling of I don't belong here. Right? And so one of the things I tell them is I worked so hard my first year because I was so afraid that any minute they would find out that they made a mistake letting me in and they would kick me out. And you know, being able to, sometimes it's difficult to be vulnerable with students, right? But I think it's really important to do so because of the student-teacher relationship, right? There is that power dynamic. And we need to be able to, I think, break that down a little bit um, so that they can see us as real people, so that they can see us as people that can help them. So um, an easy way to start with this, icebreakers. Um, for online classes, of course, I'm sure many of you do icebreakers, but they should be low stakes, they should be fun, and they should be something reflective, something that lets students get to know each other as people, not just as other students in the classroom. So some th silly things I've come up with, um, if you could only have one food on a desert island for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Who would you take to that desert island? One I've stolen from Michelle a couple times is if you'd gone back in history and could meet anybody, who would it be and why? Just something simple to get students over that idea that, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear the sound of my own voice, right? Which we've all had that experience. Okay, so um, moving on, office hours, which I call discussion time, because as many of you know, I'm sure students don't always understand what office hours are for. So one of the things that I do at the beginning of an online class is I poll students. What's your schedule like? When are you free? When could you come to office hours, which I hold via Zoom? Um, I rotate times weekly, to so I can sort of get everybody in the loop, and sometimes I offer extra credit for attending. Check-ins, I think, is another um, important one. So in an online class of eight weeks, I would typically ask students to check in every two weeks. And the questions would be quick, you know, super quick check-in, just one to three minutes. But I make a point to ask open-ended questions. Not how are things going for you, but what challenges are you facing? How can I help you? What are you most proud of? Something real quick just to kind of get the temperature of how students are feeling. Give verbal feedback. So as I said, I teach English, and so as many of you know, that means a ton of papers, right? And if, if you've done, read any of the research on the most effective kind of feedback for students to improve, you'll know that it's verbal, right? And particularly a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And so VoiceThread and some other tools like it allow you to do that, right? So you can look at the student's paper online, your, the time that you spend responding to their paper actually decreases because you know what you want to say and the power of your voice is you can say it kindly, right? As opposed to like worrying over what's the exact phrasing and how is the student going to receive that. One of the things I do when I do verbal feedback is I ask students to repeat it back to me. Tell me in your own words what I just told you about how to make your paper better. So. Doing this, as I said, you know, what I'm, what I'm hoping for is that all of my students feel supported, that they feel like that they can come to me for help if they're struggling with anything. And but I think it really, by creating that environment sort of levels the playing field, which a few of my colleagues here have spoken about today, and makes students more willing to be open, to be vulnerable, to ask for help and to do better. Um, and so I just want to play you a little snippet of, um, this is a student responding to um, a reading from the week. And this is a student that I had had in a face-to-face -face class, and she had never said a single thing in class. So 
somebody else with this one earlier. Thanks, Fabiola. And also, as Michelle always says in her classes, be patient with technology. My favorite reading from this week was Don and Lamont reading from Bird by Bird. I think the part that it was kind of like a click in my head almost is when she started describing the way to get rid of all the voices that were preventing her from being able to write. And the reason that that resonated with me was because I remember a couple years back I was um, at a doctor's office and they had these little informational pamphlets and then one of them was how to get rid of anxiety. And I remember um, there was like this whole section about putting your anxiety in a jar, in, like in your head, and then just putting that like in a box and then storing the box away somewhere deep in your mind. I just felt like I never knew that that could be applicable to other things, like things that are preventing you from being creative. Um, in the previous chapters, Anne Lamont even mentions these thoughts are her mental illnesses. You don't really think about how these blocks in your mind are just anxieties and just like fears. You just kind of think of them as, oh, you know, this is true, my writing sucks and all that. So I just thought that was interesting and that's why I really enjoyed this reading. I think that's the end of our presentation anyway. So thank you. And we'll take any questions that people have. And we're gonna, just so you know, since we are archiving this, um, if you could let us know who your question is for, then we'll pass the mic and then that person will repeat your question and we'll go from there. Well, we only have one, so I can't do that. So you go ahead. I don't know what syllabus you're talking about. He's asking me how long it took me to create my syllabus. So for the, the history. Oh, history of photography? I don't know. Um, probably not as much time as it would have taken me to do the other kind of syllabus that I made before that. Um, I, I, yeah, so I, I use, I, the, the syllabus you're referring to is, I created that with a tool called popular.me and it embeds video right into, so the syllabus becomes digital, or I like to refer to it as liquid, and it creates a, a place in, uh, the syllabus then becomes a place for my students to get to know me and hear me and welcome them to the class instead of a place to just read policies and get scared. Come back there next. We missed the URL for the site. The URL for we'll our resource the, we'll site on the screen for you. is tiny.cc, that's T I N Y dot CC slash humanizing dash O T C one seven. If you didn't get that, I'm going to leave it up here. You can take a picture of it before you go. And it's all lowercase, by the way, okay? Next question. This is for Fabiola. What technology did you use for your videos? They were all great and very humanizing, <laughs> but how easy was that? And what technology did you use to streamline that? So the question was what technology I used? Um, um, iMovie. So I just said new project, import, and then that's it. And then very little editing. Did you use it also creative? Uh, what I do, I have my own YouTube and it's, un, you know, it's unlisted. Only students have the URL. And, um, and it's just, it's just my, my YouTube page. If you click on those two videos, it actually takes you to my public videos that I do share with the community. If you are on a Mac, a QuickTime Pro, a QuickTime player will record straight from your webcam and save a file that you can then upload into YouTube. Or if you happen to have a smartphone, you can get the YouTube Creator app 
um, or maybe it's just the regular YouTube app. I always get those confused, but just record right into YouTube or record one on your phone and then upload it into YouTube using the app. Next question. Next question. Anyone? Okay, so I, I've been just delving into universal design for learning and thinking about individualized teaching for students that um, are across the spectrum in, in abilities, um, disabilities, maybe class, gender, race issues too that make some of those bigger speed bumps as we started out talking about. Um, so I'm wondering if we go so digital, which is something I'm grappling with as both a face-to-face -face teacher and somebody who's been tasked with creating an online course for our second semester writing um, requirement. Um, for students that may struggle with the technology itself, meaning hearing or visually, or I was thinking of the syllabus that's created with video, do you also supply things that can be printed and um, more accessible for students that have different learning needs? And if there's a technology or a way to kind of help us get to that resource? Oh, I don't know who that's directed to. So Michelle, why don't, why don't you talk about your, your throwaway stuff versus the, your policies at CSU on captioning and... I don't know what you're referring to, but... Okay, <laughs> good, then you do. I think he's talking about caption sync, et cetera. Like, because basically your question is, how do you make this stuff accessible to, to everyone, Somebody right? Somebody who's hearing impaired, for example. Yeah. So if you're talking about audio, it, yeah, so we have um, the voice thread, that, for example, which Kim spoke about at Chan CSU Channel Islands. We have a site license for voice thread, and we've worked very, very hard. I think we might be the first institution to make this happen to work with voice thread and a third party um, captioning service, Automatic Sync Technology. Their product is Caption Sync. They were actually here at OTC. And so we have an account with them, and they integrate directly into voice thread. And so we, it's like a matter of a clicking a button and the, the captions appear. In addition to that, you know, a digital syllabus, um, the, the tool that, that I used that I referenced earlier, at the bottom of the page, there's a link to download a PDF of that version. If you use Google Docs, it's a, it's a great option because um, it allows students to have that digital version or download it into um, a format of their choice. Other questions? Does the panel have any questions for the audience? Oh, yeah. um, what are your favorite books on, along these lines? Give one, and then let's pass the mic on this. You, you want to start? Um, well, Michelle has a book, <laughs> which I would recommend. <laughs> It's called Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies. It just came out in the second edition in May. For Teaching with Emerging Technologies. It's got Is that lots link of on the resources off the site? Um, I can add it there. I don't think I put it there, but I'd be happy to. I think it's linked in my bio on the site. And if you come to OTC 2018, you could probably get her to sign it. <laughs> Anyone else have a response to that I, question? I do. Uh, my favorite book on this whole arena, and it really isn't straight up on the, on the pedagogy so much as it is on the arena, is a book called Disrupting Class. I'm not sure if you haven't read Disrupting Class. I think it's, I think it's an interesting book. It's about, it's about the adoption of technology broadly by, uh, by educational institutions. Um, I'm also a learning theorist. I have a degree in learning theory, so a lot of the work that I do is based on two theorists, which is Jean Anion and, of course, uh, Paolo Fieri. Um, and basically, the, the essence here is that it, we have to make it matter. We have to make our course content matter. So we have to figure it out. And sometimes, like I said, when we find the dork inside of us, we can actually um, allow ourselves to be not be so, you know, I'm from the academic world, you know, we aren't hiding behind our degrees. We're just still a, a learning person. Much of what I've gotten the chance to be able to learn was actually, again, through Michelle's book. And also, I was a guest participant in her blended learning program where she was 
uh, where she was a facilitator for that program as well. And so I've actually learned quite a bit from her. Um, and also the other instructors in their online, uh, their humanizing online uh, seminars as well on YouTube pages. I, I'd like to add one thing to that. Um, I really encourage you, if you're not already, to get on Twitter and to build a community of educators that you follow because that's where I learn continuously all the time. Anytime I open my Twitter feed, I learn something amazing. Um, and in, in regards to books, what Fabiola just said, you know, you're talking about the need to be vulnerable. If you're not familiar with the work of Brene Brown, I really recommend that you, you look her up. She's got several books. Any of them are fantastic. Brene, Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E, -E, Brown, B-R-O-W-N. And what she really, uh, just a few takeaways. Vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity and innovation. And if we aren't willing to be vulnerable, we aren't going to innovate anything. And I think the more faculty I work with, I realize what a barrier that is. Um, letting go, letting our guard down, being a little silly. And once you get there, you realize how awesome it can be. <laughs> I like to focus on instructor engagement. You know, we hear so much about student engagement, but there's something to be said about instructor engagement too. If you haven't had an opportunity to see George Kuro speak, hear him speak, um, it's called the Innovator's Mindset. And it really, I'm, I'm rereading the, the section on empathy right now, and I think this, that really fits what the humanizing panel did today, is that you, know, you approach things with empathy and with respect and honoring your students as well as honoring yourself. So thank you very much. Kouros, C-O-U-R-O-S. Follow him on Twitter. Okay, all right. <laughs> so there were a lot of sessions, including one that I helped with uh, at this conference about um, student services and trying to integrate student services more into online student experience. And I'm just curious, because I think, you know, to some extent, I think some people might superficially think that humanizing online education means just trying to push students more into the student services and and sometimes that it seems like there's a little bit of a trade-off because what you all have talked about is this very personal connection the nudges all of those things where other faculty might say that's not my job that's student services job so i'm wary of this sort of line between you know kind of giving faculty an out almost by saying yeah integrate student services and they do that stuff and you just teach. I don't want it to, that message to be there, but I also don't want to feel like humanizing means you're just endlessly nudging and coaching and doing all these things that student service professionals really can do very well also. So I guess I'm just looking for if you, any of you have ideas or thoughts on how to humanly nudge your students sometimes away from you and to student services um, and when that's not appropriate or I don't know. I think you get what I'm asking, though. I sort of grabbed the microphone because <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think, you know, we, I'm lucky. I'm at a college that has an amazing student services organization. Uh, and they, uh, if you ask people in student services there, they would tell you that their role is to support what happens in the classroom because that's where the primary relationship for what we're here to do is. And they're, they see their role as... Um, solving problems for students that are getting in the way of them being successful in the classroom but not really you know insert they're not part of the classroom they're part of knocking barriers down to get students into classrooms and I think for online instructors knowing what you're knowing what student services are available to you you know, you know, you have, and knowing where to go, knowing where to send students, knowing the kind of resources. When somebody mentions that they have a problem with transportation, knowing where, how to get them a, not how to get them a bus pass, who to point them to to get the bus pass. Uh, when somebody has a problem with, you know, physical abuse in their home, uh, you know, knowing how to how to get that problem surfaced in the right part of student services. Those are not problems that faculty are well equipped to solve, and and I don't. I don't think we necessarily should be. We should be well equipped, though, to recognize when somebody might need that help 
and know enough about the resources to point them in the right direction. That's just my bias there. Yeah, to, um, to add on to that, I think the most important thing to tell faculty is you do you, right? Like, not everybody's going to be a Fabiola, right? But to be the, mo the best you, the most real, genuine you that you can be, and if all that touchy-feely stuff doesn't work for you, don't do it. Um, you know, but it is, I think, on all faculty to be cognizant of what's going on with students, and as Ray said, to know where to point them to. And, you know, like situations that we are not qualified to deal with, we shouldn't deal with, right? And, I, and that, I think, you know, the, the, the important thing, I think, to take away there is, is just the idea that you don't, we don't all have to be the same, right? Just be the most you you can be. Thank you. We are actually over time. So thank you so much for being here, everyone. I hope you had a great OTC 17, and we look forward to seeing you back next year.